Welcome to Plus One Forward, the podcast powered by the Apocalypse, where we talk about tabletop role-playing games using or inspired by the Apocalypse engine. I'm your MC, Rach. And I'm your co-MC, Rich. Tonight, we're joined by our guest, Mark D.S. Truman of Magpie Games. Hey, Mark, welcome back to the show. Hello, hello. It's such a pleasure to be here. Plus One Forward is like the real deal for me, right? Like a, like a game is <laughs> real when I've showed up on Plus One Forward. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. I'm glad you feel that way. Well, as we can tell, Mark is a returning podcast guest. You may remember him from our Urban Shadows or Cartel episodes. It's been a while since we've last spoken. So we have a question. What PBTA game has impacted you the most since you were last on? Now, beyond your own game, because I'd imagine that would be pretty impactful. Well, I mean, I think my own game is often often feels like drowning in a swimming pool of your own ideas. So I, I don't know how much it impacts me as much as torments <laughs> me. For for ideas, man, I will tell you that I have been beyond honored and pleased to work with Miguel and Hel Espinosa on the wall. So I've been I've been working with Miguel as his developmental editor, and he has so many interesting ideas for putting this really rich, really interesting setting of Nahual into play. If you're not familiar with the game, you play Nahualis in Mexico, who are people who are touched by this shamanic energy, the Nahual, and have the ability to transform into these like animalistic, hybrid, kind of half-human, half-animal things. And they're all different, like the jaguar or the monkey or the, the serpent. And they hunt angels who were brought to Mexico during the conquista, right? When the Spanish came to Mexico. And so the angels are these terrifying things that wiped out all the shamans back in the 1500s. And these people that are left over are like the ones who ended up with the power, but don't understand it. Right. So now they hunt the angels, cook them and serve them as tacos or make drinks out of them. It's a very Mexican game, but I will say that like Miguel has so many ideas that are really inspiring for me about connecting community to play and really trying to think of both the PCs as like this really interesting unit, but also how their business interacts with the community and how they interact with the community. So super inspiring to work with him on, on that game. Nice. Now it is a really, really cool game. Read a sitch. All right, here we are in read a sitch. This is the segment where our guest gets to talk about something happening at uh, his tables or just a general idea of, actual play could be a a discussion a journal of play or observations about things that are going on in pbta world mark you always have observations that interest me and um i am quite excited about this little nugget so what do you want to talk about this time so i've been running obviously a ton of cartel getting ready to finalize that game the book shipping now right like it's it's happening but cartel and urban shadows which i've been playtesting as well both have a lot of player versus player action. And I've been thinking a lot about kind of the underlying resources that are necessary for PvP and like what makes PvP pleasurable at a Powered by the Apocalypse table. I mean, obviously, you know, a lot of PvT games don't use PvP, really. I mean, Dungeon World doesn't really have tools for PvP. Mm -hmm. You know, Monster of the Week, you know, you're kind of on the same team. And that's cool. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't want every game I play to be just constant drama between the players. But there's a whole class of games that have been very successful and have really gotten a lot of mileage, like Monster Hearts, where Mm -hmm. the Menaces chapter in Monster Hearts 1, I don't even remember reading it halfway through running a game, right? Like, the PCs are just making each other crazy. So I'm thinking a lot about what do we need in a game and what do we need as GMs to make PvP work at the table and what makes it great? What would you say would be a starting point for making PvP a central part of a game? Oh, that's, that's such a great question. I feel like there has to be a fairly strong holding environment, meaning like we talk about this at Backpile all the time, like this idea that there's something in the structure of the story that keeps the PCs constantly engaging with each other. So for example, in Monster Hearts, it's usually everybody goes to the same school. And if you don't go to the same school, you at least live in the same relatively small town, the suburb or whatever it is that you are in. You're probably not in New York City necessarily, right? Where you get dragged in totally different directions. So when I look at the games that have really succeeded with PvP, Like cartel is in Durango, Mexico. Like you can't leave. You're not going anywhere. You're stuck with each other. So if we have a big blowout fight as characters, Rach, we can't just be like, okay, peace. I'm never talking to you again. (laughs) Like I have to come back and engage you, right? And so before we even talk about the systems, I feel like there's a central sort of fictional spot we got to get to. And Apocalypse World has it. I mean, the original Apocalypse World, how many people live in a hard hold? Mm. Maybe 200. So if there's a big fight, 
people go and sulk in their corners, but the second the cannibals show up, we've all got to get back on the same page and have some further interaction. So holding environment, got it, makes sense. Can't run away, can't just uh, diss and, and deuces out. What do you think about PBTA allows for that PVP without hurt feelings? Is there anything like mechanically mm. or genre-wise with these games that have allowed PVP to take place without making enemies out of the people at the table? I mean, I think I'm kind of spoiled by the kinds of players that come to PBTA games, right? They tend to be people who are interested in narrative before winning, like, but they, that's not why they play games. Mostly because if you want to win a PBTA game, I have some very bad news for you. You, you can't. <laughs> the GM will has an infinite number of problems to throw at you. You're never going to you're never going to solve them all until maybe the very end of the campaign. Whereas in D&D, you can say, well, we cleared this dungeon, we saved this town, everything's done, this is good, we move on to the next town. In Powered by the Apocalypse, we say, well, yeah, you saved the town, but now the town's economy has crashed because the goblins were the main draw, blah, blah, right? So, so I think that there's something about the people who are drawn to this kind of game that makes them a little more open to the distance you have to have from your character to lose a PvP fight and feel good about it, to say... My teenage superhero got beat up by this other teenage superhero, and that was super cool. That was a super cool scene. But I also think there's something about what Vincent has talked about in terms of shifting narratives from comparisons to bangs, meaning like in a typical role-playing game, as we, you know, as I played as a kid, right, you would say, okay, the orc has this much hit points and my sword does this much damage. And so we'd say, okay, my strength is this much. If I roll this much, I hit or don't hit. Everything is about kind of comparing thresholds. If you're this strong, you can break down the door. But in Apocalypse World, we don't really compare thresholds. We're not interested if the werewolf is strong enough to do damage to the giant monster. We just roll and we see, oh, it's a miss. Well, maybe you do do damage, but something else happens. Or maybe you don't do damage and you get hurt. Or comparison is not the major element. So I think sometimes... When I'm playing a PvP game and I lose, it's not because I compared my strength to another player's strength and found it wanting. It's because that narrative moment, that bang, that thing that's happening, didn't go my way. Hmm. And so I think that there is a sense that it wasn't that my character failed or came up short. It was that the narrative did not go the way I was expecting or wanted it to go. I think back to a game I played of original Apocalypse World where I was playing a hard holder. I was totally fucking awesome. And at the end of the game, me and this other player who had used a gun lugger, he's kind of a savage, crazy murder hobo. I, I basically was like, you know, went aggro on him, was like, you're going to be nice to people from now on. And I just missed. And the GM was like, yeah, you can shoot him. So he shoots me. <laughs> right. And like, I just get, you know, shoots me like he's seven harm or whatever. Right. And I have like three armor. So I'm like filling up, I like, take a scar, whatever, to stay in the game. And he looks at me and he says, I'll think about it. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, it's perfect. I totally lost, but it did not end. It wasn't like, oh, and then I lost. And therefore that was the end of it. It was just like, that's where our relationship was. He shot me in the face and then was like, ah, I kind of like you. <laughs> and that like just felt so PBTA for me, right? This is a moment I'm always going to remember. It's hot. What words of wisdom do you have for players who might be apprehensive about player versus player mechanics? I have a lot of sympathy for people who've had bad experiences. <laughs> like I, I totally feel people who come in to the table and are like, uh, do I want this? The first and most important thing is you need to establish a second level of conversation beyond what's said in the game. So if you're able to tell your other, your friends, your friends, right? Hopefully you're playing with friends, right? That like you, <laughs> but that you're like, that wasn't fun. Can we try that again or do that again? There's nothing that says you cannot revisit a scene when it's over and play it a second time or, or think about saying, you know, hey, I know this role worked out this way, but I don't like this. It doesn't make me feel good. Can we talk about it? I think that establishing that second level is really important. And it's funny to me how often our group just pushes back against me as a GM and it feels totally natural. Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's really, that makes me feel really differently about this NPC. Is that what you want? And I'm like, oh no, 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 I don't want that. I'm sorry. Let me say this again and try it again. But beyond that, I think that if they're looking at a game like Cartel or Monster Hearts or Urban Shadows, they should look at the ways in which the system absorbs energy. So a really easy one that's in Apocalypse World 2 is in Urban Shadows, if you get hit really hard, you can always mark a scar and your character's fine, right? Like you'll, you'll be fine. 
And that scar is going to cost you usually have a negative one to a stat. But you almost always have a stat you probably don't use that much anyway because your 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 wizard's really not going to use blood, right? Or your your taint is really not going to use mind in that same way, right? So so you've got some ways in which really direct player versus player conflict may actually be a little less direct than you think it is. Hmm. The MC's job, especially in PBTA games, above all other games, is to be a fan of your character and ensure that the temperature is the right temperature. Meaning like, if we're just shooting at each other, that's not interesting. But if we're never shooting at each other, why are we playing, right? So trusting that the game and the MC's role in the game are going to try, they might not always succeed, to build in good scenes for that PvP conflict. I think that's what I would tell somebody who's nervous about it, that this is really a system where everybody's interested out of character and having a good time And the system supports that interest, no matter what's happening in the fiction. That's really thoughtful, actually. Yeah, I mean, I think Cartel is really challenging for folks because I think they recognize very early that the stakes are very high. Like, Mm -hmm. they have this sense of like, oh, man, my character could die, like, right now. And then as they play, they start to learn that it's impossible to really avoid danger because that's the setting is just dangerous so they have to lean into it they have to play to it they have to scheme and and push and lie and cheat and and get there and as they do so it's kind of cool to see them come alive and recognize that proactively engaging in the pvp is actually safer than trying to avoid it right and trying to to not have it happen that the systems that kick in as you come into conflict are really fun and they push you in interesting ways and I think that was always my goal with Cartel and with Urban Chow to some degree is give you tools to have fights, quote, 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 right? Fights in character of all kinds that when you leave, you say, oh, man, that moment was so hot. <laughs> it was so good when we were both <laughs> like at each other's throats, right? Because we as friends, like Mark and Rach, understand that my tainted and your wizard may not like each other, but Mark the person and Rach the person are having a blast watching these two forces come up against each other. And then maybe kiss. I don't know. That'd probably be cool too, right? Like both fight and kiss. Intimacy move exists for a reason. <laughs> exactly. So I, I've i been at games where mono e mono, one player against one player, PvP. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. But then it kind of tilts sometimes if like, there's another PC who's coming after my guy and another mm. PC who's coming at, and mm. like I feel dog piled and mm. then it like it tilts my entire perception of it. Is that just a thing where I've got to talk it out like, hey, guys, I'm feeling like a little oof. Uh, or is there something from my perception of that interaction that can help me pull out of that downward spiral that I've, I've felt myself go into when it happened a few times? Yeah, no, I, I hear that. I think. We were in a game of, I think it was probably an indie plus game of Monster Hearts where my werewolf was trying to get the mortal to not hook up with the vampire. And about halfway through, I realized I was being that guy who was like, I'm your real friend who doesn't have a crush on you at all, but I definitely do. And I don't want you to hang out with this other guy because <laughs> he's a bad guy. And Mark, the player, was like, damn it, like, why? <laughs> like, like, what is wrong with me that I'm doing this? This like terrible friend zone pattern of complaining to this woman about how she doesn't like me. And like, it definitely made me feel like outside of the narrative. Like it, I wasn't in it in the same way, right? I was having this other emotional experience. And I think that that's like the pain and the promise of Apocalypse World is that I don't want my players to be completely distant from their characters, right? I don't want to say like, okay, you're playing cartel. I never want you to actually feel stressed or scared because if you don't feel those things, why are we playing? Mm. Like we can just move pieces around a chessboard or board game and you're fine. Like you can evaluate resources and have a good time at that distance. But if you're playing a power by the apocalypse game, I want you to feel sometimes like, you know, you're playing mass. I want you to feel like, shut up, dad. I do what I like. Right. Like I want you to have that feeling, but there is a time where following the fiction can lead to some ugly places for you as a player. And I think this is one of them when there are four people at the table and all three of them are allied against you. I think that the power of Powered by the Apocalypse is the power of shifting and changing narratives, which is to call out to the table, hey, this dynamic is fine, but can we also seek some other dynamics? Can we find some place that me and you can work together and frame a scene around that in this infinite world of conflicts that we're building and try to disrupt that dynamic a little bit? And as a GM, I mean, I think the GM bears a lot of responsibility here for finding ways to take existing conflicts and when they start to recycle 
which is like a negotiations term where you're just saying the same thing again. Like I offered you this much money. You offered me that much money. Mm-hmm. Then we just say again, I offered you this much money. You have no, no movement, just the same arguments again. At that moment as a GM, I really try to step in and like change it up. Some new force shows up, some new opportunity arises, something that shifts the power dynamic at the table. And I don't think players should feel weird about calling out those dynamics and saying like, hey, can we switch this up? Can we mix it up? Because I think that, yeah, you, that, that little bit of bleed that makes Power of the Apocalypse great can actually keep you from enjoying the fiction that's building. And so we, we as a team of people have to talk about like, it's not an X card thing. It's not like I'm X carding this dynamic. It's can we shift and find some other places because this is not where I want to be for the next seven sessions. I just want to mix it up down the road. That's a tool that when we talk about structure and we talk about long-term potential for Power by the Apocalypse, we're constantly looking at new ways to employ that in the game to make things mixed up and different, but talking is one of the best tools. All right. Well, we had you on not just to pull PVP out of your brain. I think you're here to talk about a game or something, too. Why don't we open our brains to it? That sounds great, man. Open your brain. It's time to open our brains, where Mark is going to discuss a Powered by the Apocalypse game with us. We're going to talk about what, Mark? I'm so excited. We're going to talk about Urban Shadows Second Edition. Wood, wood. Oh my gosh. Yeah, we're super excited. I mean, Urban Shadows came out, it, it feels like a million years ago, but it was it was really only like 2015. But it in the long ago time, Urban Shadows was the first Powered by the Apocalypse game Magpie Games released. And it kind of set us off on this path of exploring very different structures and very different ideas about what gaming is. And now coming back to it, one of the reasons that we were excited to come back to it is every time we cracked it open, we're like, oh man, we do that totally differently. And oh man, this playbook doesn't quite work. And and oh, I know that, that people are having trouble getting their PCs and enough scenes together. And we could just see all these problems that five, six, seven years of Powered by the Apocalypse design we hadn't solved, but that we had new perspectives on. And so I'm super, super, super excited to come back to Urban Shadows and bring a whole bunch of new tools and ideas to it. For our listeners who might be brand new to Urban Shadows or hearing about this game for the first time, what's the game about? What's the setting? Yeah, so Urban Shadows is a political powered by the apocalypse urban fantasy game in which all of the characters are movers and shakers in a supernatural world of debt and obligation and violence and mystery and magic. And so unlike, say, like the Dresden Files, which is more like noir, like one detective kind of delves into the world. Urban Shadows draws more on the crime fiction genre, where there are many, many factions, many powerful players who are all always in conflict with each other. And your PCs as vampires, wizards, werewolves, demons, fairies, are caught in the middle of many competing obligations, while also dealing with the realities of gender and race and ethnicity at the level of the city and the mortal world. So it's about the intersection of multicultural communities wrapped in this great metaphor of urban fantasy and magic and danger and everything that we love about the traditional urban fantasy role-playing game. What mechanics are different in Urban Shadows 2nd Edition versus 1st? Great. So there are a couple of big changes that I was excited to make for for 2nd Edition. The first one is we're revising the violence move. And Urban is kind of a great example of like the technical nerdery that occurs at the Magpie Games office. So the first version of Unleash an Attack in Urban Shadows had this thing where if you rolled a 10 plus, you deal some damage and then like nothing would happen. Like you deal the damage. And on a seven to nine, like you would maybe take some damage or maybe not take some damage. But the new move for turn to violence is way more interesting. So the first thing is on a hit, You inflict your harm as established, but your opposition gets a chance to inflict harm on you or put you in a bad spot or create an opportunity to flee. So as a GM, I'm really excited about that because I can actually say, oh, my NPC that you're about to beat up on is going to get out of here. Like he's, he's got to run. What do you do? And that gives us a really cool momentum into the next set of conflicts. And this is such a great example of how we think about Powered by the Apocalypse games. It's like old move works fine. Like it's never going to cause you problems. But the goal of our new moves, as this is an example, is to always give the GM, always give the players somewhere new to go when the move resolves. And so it's a great example of the kind of work we're doing throughout the system to just clean up, refine, and drive forward fiction more 
completely and with less work on everybody's part. We're also looking for ways to really connect players to the fiction and ask a little less of them at the table. Urban Shadows turns out to be a really heavy game sometimes. Like you have to define a lot about the city. How do werewolves work? How do vampires work? Because we're not going to tell you. It's your city. You're going to build it. But the old let it out move used to be one where you would have a bunch of abstract options. Like you'd let it out and you could then seize a vulnerable thing. And in my head and in play, it should be like, yeah, the vampire tears the car door off or the wizard traps the spirit or whatever abstract thing happens. But in play, players didn't know what to do. <laughs> they were like, when do I do this? When do I do this really abstract thing? So we're moving over to a new framework of abilities. So every playbook has four abilities that are theirs to use with the let it out move. Nice. So when you hit on let it out, you get to choose to activate one of those abilities. And if you get a seven to nine, you also have to mark a corruption which we'll talk about in a second. But on a 10 plus, you can choose a second ability or or ignore the corruption. So structurally, it's the same move, but by giving players really explicit tools, we let people say, okay, I'm the wolf. Great, I'm gonna heal two harm. I'm gonna transform from one form into another. I'm gonna perform a ferocious feat of lupine strength or speed. And those are still kind of abstract, like they have a lot of room for people to operate within them, but they also give players extremely specific, actionable tags to grab onto and do something meaningful with. And so for us, second edition is all about this. It's all about finding ways where there were speed bumps and friction and smoothing that out and giving players a much more cohesive experience. And if this is your first time playing Urban Shadows, you won't even notice. <laughs> that's, that's the goal. <laughs> it all just fits together. On the bigger picture, we're making some changes to the overall structure of factions. The word faction turned out to be kind of endlessly confusing for people because it kind of is supposed to represent a community, right? There's four factions. Each one is a different part of the city. The knight faction was supposed to be the criminal elements, the folks who care about blood and sex and drugs and territory, like vampires and werewolves. And the power faction was supposed to be wizards and oracles and people who cared about like the future and the nature of reality and metaphysics. But the word faction really threw people. Uh, sometimes people are confused, like, wait, are all the wizards working together? Do the wizards all have meetings together? What does it mean for them to be a faction? So we're shifting that over to call them circles. So each one is a circle of people, the way you would think about a circle of these people all work in nonprofits, or these people all work on street level stuff, we're doing community organizing. And that's a sense of they know each other, they agree about what kind of things matter, but they may or may not get along. And then within those circles, we have factions like a vampire coterie or a werewolf pack or a witch's coven who are groups of people who can act together, right? And so the difference between circles and factions is the difference between a broad community and the people within that community who have power to get stuff done. And that is going to give us the opportunity to have downtimes where those factions act and where players can act in between the scenes that they play live to shape the city. And so there are some rules about status and other ways that you can influence the city long term with the goal that your characters grow from mid-level kind of people always sort of buffeted by the powers that be to the movers and shakers themselves who use downtime to influence the city as a whole. That's pretty great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we're really excited about having a better sense of the game. What's your favorite move in Urban Shadow 2nd Edition and why? Oh, that's such a, such a tough question. It's like, which of your children do you love the most? <laughs> that's right. That's so, right. I'm here and now. Yeah. So one of the other big changes that's happening is so Andrew is no longer working on Urban Shadows with us. He stepped away from gaming. Marissa Kelly has come on as my co-designer for Urban Shadows 2. And so Marissa and I have really, we, we've actually never really designed a game together. We've always been editors for each other. So, so we sit around the house and have this like super dorky moment of looking over every move and figuring out every piece and talking about everything. There are two levels I'm going to answer this question. One is mislead, distract, or trick has been completely untouched. It is probably, in my opinion, the best move I've ever written. When you try to mislead, distract, or trick someone, roll with mind. On a hit, they're fooled, at least for a moment. On a 10 plus, you pick some. On a 7 to 9, you pick some. You get to get an opportunity or fool them for longer. I wanted to design a move that was seized by force for social interactions. And what this move does for me in my game is allow people to lie and cheat and steal and have NPCs respect it. Like it sticks, it changes their behavior and it can even affect other PCs. It affects other PCs behavior. So that move, we are like, we sat down to look over everything. We're like, well, this move's not changing. This is going to be exactly as it is. But then when we open up those playbooks, especially I've gotten a chance to go and, and say, okay, what is this playbook really about? Well, how does it really work? And there's a new move on the tainted sheet that really tries to get at the idea that the tainted 
is not just somebody who goes and does jobs for the demonic forces that they work for, because they're somebody who signed away their soul, but who actually represents that demonic force in this dimension. And it's called Dark Bargain. When you seal a bargain with someone in smoke and blood, roll with heart. On a hit, you infuse the agreement with demonic force. You get to pick some options, including all parties intuitively know if the deal is being honored. All parties take plus one on going to letting it out while fulfilling the deal. So it actually makes you more powerful. Mm. Or anyone violating the pact instantly suffers for harm, armor piercing. Which for most mortals means you're Mm. just dead. That's it. And so here's the Tainid, who I think has sometimes been just a thug. like, And we really have gotten this chance to come back and be like, no, no, no. But the Tainid is supposed to be an agent. Somebody who works for someone else. And they need to represent that someone else. Even if their patron, their dark patron they sold their soul to isn't in the room. And I think this is one of my new favorite moves for seeing PCs be like, you guys want to sign a contract <laughs> to, 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 to like <laughs> put this in writing and in, and really empowering the tainted to have that control in the scene. Wow. That is pretty dope. I've really liked the dark bargain. I've always really liked the tainted, but I've never seen someone take the agent aspect of the playbook and run with it. I'm really excited to see it in play now. Great. I know audio is not the best medium for this, but I want to spotlight how stunning the draft playbooks and move sheets are. They're so good. Uh, We're so blessed and lucky to have, you know, I talked about before, Miguel Angel Espinosa working with us as our graphic designer. Him and Marissa are just like, it feels unfair to me sometimes. Like they are such gifted artists and visual thinkers. And like, I don't even try anymore. Like I don't even send them notes. Like I just say, Hey guys, here's my text. I hope you make it look beautiful. And they come back with this stuff that captures the hard lines of the city, the sense of the darkness and the corruption that's part of the game, but also like the beauty and the the spray paint and the color of it. And so, you know, I really feel like Miguel's work and Marissa's work is a huge part for us about, making Urban Shadows 2 something that any gamer off the street can pick up and understand visually, even before they start to understand how the mechanics produce the results they produce. Uh, yeah, not not just the touches, but some of the choices in the way you represent things wow me. Like the corruption is in a comp- like a white on black font. The city is a background. There's just something so compelling about how starkly different that is from the rest of the character sheet or playbook that really calls it out. It used to be kind of nested and almost hidden away. And now it's just, yeah, I've played with people who say, uh, I don't care so much about advancements. I just want to hit the corruption stuff. And I love that you've really (laughs) blown it out. It's really dope. Well, corruption is advancement. Yeah. Well, corruption's advancement, right? Like like Rachel, they're they're all all monsters, monsters, right? There's two kinds of advancement (laughs) in Urban Shadows, and we're actually playing them up in this version. The first side is the getting to know other other circles part. It's the networking in the city. And if you go and look at those advancements now, they're much more focused around building your reputation, getting new assets, being able to do more in the city because people respect you. And then corruption is the other side of the coin. As you play the game, for those of you who aren't familiar, you'll have to mark corruption when you do things that are kind of evil or bad or, or seizing power or when moves tell you to mark corruption because you give in to your darker nature. And as corruption fills, you get new moves. And there's only a small cost to those moves. It's more corruption. And so <laughs> you're just going to start marking that more corruption. And then one day you're going to wake up and realize, wait, 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 when I fill this corruption track too many times my character becomes an NPC. And that roller coaster of mark the corruption, mark the corruption, mark the corruption. Oh, wait, 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 I got to be a good person now. That is like so central to those stories of power and darkness. And what Miguel has done here with this, Marissa put it perfectly. She said, the corruption track now looks like it wants to eat the rest of your sheet. Like it's coming (laughs) up from the bottom. It's so true. (laughs) It wants to consume you, right? And that for me is the power of Urban Shadows. It's it's not just the multiculturalism and the kind of intersections, but this feeling of like real questions, like what are you willing to do to win? Like what are you willing to do to do what you think is right? Are you willing to give up what makes you you? And that is, I think, an enduring theme of urban fantasy. And it's so cool that back from draft one, Andrew had these ideas about how corruption was going to work. And we, I think we've done some really good work to intensify it and represent it in this new version. Okay, I'm super, super hyped. I know that we've got to get this to the table for a brief AP. Are you okay if we act under fire here? Yeah, of course. I'm excited. Man. I love running urban shadows. It is time to act 
Under Fire. Here we are in Act Under Fire, where our guest, Mark Diaz Truman, will be running a bit of Urban Shadows. I'm going to hand the baton. Rach is the uber fan for Urban Shadows. I don't want to steal any of her amazing spotlight. So, Rach, take the ball and run with it. Have fun. I'm going to be an avid audience member here. Tell us about your character. I looked through the playbooks that we had as samples, and there was no Oracle, and then there was no Scholar, so I'm going to have to play my OC Curtis Scanlon, my Urban Shadows character who has been around for years at this point, as a wizard, which he ended the last campaign as, so I guess that's canon. Perfect. Curtis is a uh, beleaguered wizard. He has a sanctum with magical wards and a focus circle, a library and some relics scattered around. It's a apartment top floor of a penthouse. It's not his penthouse per se, which is why he's a crappy car. Any other details we should let our audience know about, Mark? What are the downsides of your sanctum? The downsides of my sanctum is it's cursed by its previous owner, and that it is a location known by many. Yeah, that's great. How do people know about your sanctum? Like, do you meet a lot of people there or is it because of the previous owner? It's because of the previous owner and also the current owner. (laughs) It's not really Curtis's apartment. It's actually Curtis's boyfriend's apartment. And he's a mover and shaker that will remain off screen for this AP who attracts a lot of attention. And, you know, sometimes in the middle of the night, you get people who show up at your doorstep. Right. That's great. Cool. And uh, so how long have you been in the city? Like, we'll say this is in Boston, the penthouse downtown, looking out over the river, right? How long have you been here? Oh, my God. It's the penthouse I've actually physically been to. (laughs) I would say uh, at this, I took photos. It was before the COVID times. He's been here, I think, at this point for six months. Okay. Awesome. And what conflict are you currently trying to mediate in the city? There is a conflict where... Boston really wants to expand out its uh, metro line. I, I don't remember what it's called. Is it the metro? Anyway, it's subway system. But they're coming across a uh, conflict with the local Fay who feel like they haven't granted the proper permission for development to pass through their territory. Great. So there's probably some wizards behind that expansion, right? Like it hooks up with ley lines and it shifts the city's future. Yeah, it, it's supposed to help you commute to downtown faster, or that's what everyone tells us is going to happen. <laughs> I love it. Great. And why is Curtis involved in this? Do you have like friends on both sides? Like, What led you to be a mediator here? He's kind of connected in with uh, members within the power circle, and he has some contacts on the Fae and Wild side as well, who have dragged him and saying, no, 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 you, you got to go talk to these wizards. You understand them better than us. Make sure we get a good deal out of this. That's perfect. Great. I love it. Cool. So let's do a a starting debt. So basically in Urban Shadows, debts are the only real currency. If you're a wizard, you can make money appear from nothing. Diamonds fall from your tears, right? So what does money matter? It's debts that drive things. So let's do one or two of these and kind of fill out our city with a few of fun NPCs. So look at my starting debts. Someone is helping keep your demons at bay. You owe them a debt. I think the demons at bay is... This isn't Curtis's first adventure. He has a lot of enemies and demons in his background that he's keeping at bay. There was an incident in New Orleans. The protection of the members of the Fae community here helped keep those people coming in from like other cities and pushing it on territory. Let's go with that person having the name June. And June is is your friend in Wild who's helped you helped you kind of stay off the radar. Exactly. I love it. That's great. Okay, cool. And let's do one more. Someone is your go-to when you get into trouble providing information or muscle to get things done. You owe them two debts. Okay. Now, usually this would be with other PCs, right? Because we really want to tie the PCs together in fun ways. And in fact, in the new Urban Shadows, we're going to have a neighborhood as well where we're going to centralize things. So for example, Rach and I could be using the downtown neighborhood, which would actually give us a bunch of personal relationships between the PCs, anchor NPCs, locations. So everybody's kind of going to the same places and visiting the same things. But because it's just me and Rach, we're just going to do NPCs and make sure they have lots of debts and things. So Rach, tell us about this person who you owe two debts going to go with their name being Andre. Okay. What's a good faction for someone who is muscle, but also someone reliable and thoughtful? I think it's fun if they're... Actually, it's a circle, Yeah, right? circle. <laughs> I think it's fun if maybe it's from the Mortalis circle, right? The people who are on the border between mortality, the rest of humanity, and this supernatural world. So maybe somebody who's 
maybe not like a, a really hardcore hunter, but like someone who knows about the supernatural world and is willing to back you up. Oh, I wonder if Andre is a bouncer at a bar that caters to uh, the supernatural regulars. Yeah, yeah. Like a werewolf bar, right? Where it's like everything's kind of tough and rumble yeah. and he like hangs with the werewolves still. Definitely. Like he can hold his own. That's great. I love it. Okay, good. Cool. And then finally... I'm going to have you pick one corruption move. Now, oftentimes when we do a one shot, I'll give people a corruption move to get started just so that they have a little juice, a little a little corruption to get things rolling. So you have a couple of options, Rach. Can you pick one of the corruption moves you think would be fun? Let's go with the dark arts. Okay, great. When you turn to violence with magic or psychic energies, mark corruption to roll with spirit instead of Oof. blood. I mean, given how high my spirit is and how low my blood is, it might be <laughs> Perfect. I love it. So Curtis has this dark magic just lurking behind the surface. That's great. All right. So let's say it's the middle of the night. It's your penthouse. There's a storm outside, the rain pelting the window in sort of late fall, like now, like October, right? You're awoken from a relatively deep sleep into this relatively large penthouse by a catastrophic banging on your front door, like like a frantic, absolutely terrified banging. Yeah, I think Curtis is going to scramble to his feet and race a bit to the door, but as he approaches sort of take stock of the situation because it is the middle of the night. The weather is absolutely poor out there. Who the heck is going to be coming to this penthouse and know how to get through security at this hour? You probably have like a keyhole, right, to look through or the, or the little little peephole to look and see who's there. Oh, definitely. I think that's going to be step number one is looking through that peephole. Perfect. Who's on the other side? Yeah, so you see this clearly supernatural person like they're in urban channels we don't have a lot of secrets like people know each other it's like everybody kind of knows who's in the only way you can have a debt is for people to know that you're one of us otherwise why would anybody take your word for anything but you this person even by supernatural standards is not being particularly careful they have these kind of like scales that are growing out of their skin and their form is kind of fluctuating and seizing it's clearly somebody from wild somebody from the circle that's not from this dimension. So when we play Urban Shadows, we can't track every single NPC that you've ever met. So we have a tool called putting a name to a face or putting a face to a name, which is when a PC says, I could know this person. We're going to roll and find out what happens. So what do you think? Does Curtis have a chance of knowing this strange, wild creature outside his doorstep? Well, given that he has past interactions with the wild circle and he has his contact June, I would say yes. Yeah, that sounds great. So let's put a name to a face. Can you read it for me, Rach? When you put a name to a face or vice versa, roll with their circle. On a hit, you know their reputation. The MC will tell you what most people know about them. Great. Let's roll it. Uh, I got a four because I'm playing Curtis and will not roll over a six. Perfect. Great. So on a miss, you don't know them or you owe them MC's choice. So I'm going to say you owe this person. This is Ash. They are a demon who you know to have escaped from hell or whatever dimension is close to hell without permission. Meaning like they're not here on assignment. They're not here on contract. They found a doorway and they got out. What did this demon do to help you with a powerful spell? Was it giving you like an ingredient, giving you some some magical assistance? Why do you owe Ash? I think Ash escaped hell with certain ingredients that would otherwise be a major market for other demons and he has been selling them on the black market for a lucrative price but it requires less social navigation to get that's perfect i love it great so you hear ash shout right from the other side curtis fucking let me in man come on come on come on curtis throws the locks on the door and is like really in the middle of the night could you have called ahead ash just pushes past you right and he usually has this sort of smarmy facade with sort of a balding older white dude look but it's like falling apart like it's like he can't even concentrate to keep it together and he just immediately starts pacing gets out a pack of cigarettes and like like lights one with the end of his finger you're lucky you're not dropping your form all over my floor like really what the hell is going on are you trying to figure him out like do you want to kind of get a sense of him Yeah, I'm definitely thinking Curtis is trying to agitate him to try to figure him out, see what his reaction is like. Perfect, great. So when you try to figure someone out, roll with mine. Let's see where we go. Uh, A little bit better. I lied. That's a 10. (laughs) Perfect, great. So on a hit... I rolled over a (laughs) 6. On a hit, you ask two. Uh, You would ask another one if you're in their circle because you would just know like their vibe. But your power, he's wild, so there's some distance there. Yeah, what is Ash hoping to get from Curtis? 
he's not being completely honest with you. He's acting, it's a little bit too much. Like the form falling, the panicked banging. Ash is a pretty cool customer. You don't escape from hell because you're an idiot. Mm -hmm. He's playing it up like he's in danger because he wants protection. And what does Ash worry is going to happen? There's somebody downstairs. Like he keeps looking at the door. This is not abstract. Like I might get caught. This is like, I came here because they caught me and I'm hoping you're willing to go to bat for me. He says, look, man, you owe me, right? You fucking owe me. So uh, like pay up now. Is he trying to call in a debt? Uh, I'm not sure if he is yet. I think he wants to see how you're going to react. Ash, what do I owe you for? I don't remember. Maybe uh, prop my mind a little bit. He's like, I fucking brought you those relics. I thought our business was settled. No, no, it's not settled. And you hear the elevator down the hall ding because the door's still open, right? He didn't close it when he came through, right? You hear the elevator ding and you hear, you see his eyes go wide. He's like, look, man, I brought you those relics. I brought you that blood, that blood from Mammon. That's not even supposed to be out of hell. And I gave it to you and you used it for whatever the fuck you used it for. So here's the deal. You got to help me right now. And he like actually like takes cover behind one of your chairs and he's kind of inept at taking cover. You can tell he's not really prepared for this so he's cashing in a debt and in urban shadows both npcs and pcs can cash in debts and when they do so they have to remind their debtor why they owe you thanks for the setup rage that's awesome and for an npc i can make an npc do me a favor at a moderate cost so he wants you to protect him it's your house so he wants you to make this person go away it's definitely true. It is. Well, it's kind of. Right <laughs> Curtis's first instinct is to uh, lock the door and then throw up a ward just to put a barricade and uh, figure out what the entity on the other side is going to do next. Perfect. Cool. Good. So you're not going to refuse to honor it. You could. You could tell him like, hey, man, you don't come into my house and yell at me to do your bidding. Right. You can try to weasel out of it. But you think Curtis would probably honor it? Oh, uh, he's definitely the type of person to honor it. And I mean, it's interesting, right? <laughs> Great. And, you know, yeah, if you if you bail Ash out here, he's probably going to be, be grateful. Right. So good. So the first thing is when you honor a debt you get to start to mark some advancement, right? So your faction is power, his faction is wild. When you mark all four factions, you advance because your reputation in the city grows as you honor debts and deal with people and engage them. So go ahead and mark on the track for advancement, the wild circle. That means that wild knows you because you went to bat for Ash and, and paid your debts. But to throw up a ward, you're going to have to think about like, what kind of magic you're doing. What are you doing to gather your magical energies here? What are you doing to put something up to try to slow this person down? There's going to be a moment of Curtis grabbing a artifact. And if the audience was watching, it's clearly a demonic artifact. It's probably one Ash brought as part of the deal that they had earlier. Great. So I think Curtis is going to take a moment, grab this relic just in case he needs that extra power. And I think I'm going to let it out. That sounds great. Now, let it out works a little differently in Urban Shadows too, like we talked about. You have a set of abilities, including to deflect or redirect an oncoming blow before it strikes. So that could be like def deflecting a bullet before it hits somebody, or it could be setting up a ward that is set to deflect this blow before this person gets here. And uh, let's go ahead and let it out. Uh, let's get disappointed because that is a five. <laughs> well, sometimes you let it out. Sometimes it lets you out. As you grab up the artifact, you realize that you are just a fraction of a second too late. The ward begins to form. And right as the magic starts to wash over it, right? And I would love if we had more time to hear about what does Curtis's magic look like? I love hearing what wizards look like when they do their magic. But as it starts to form, a giant hand just punches right through the wall and the ward sort of sputters. And then the hand grabs the wall and rips it down. And you see that standing in the hallway is this sort of gargantuan troll looking creature. Definitely a fairy. Definitely somebody you could put a name to a face for if you were so inclined. But he shouts, Ash, right? And like takes the chunk of the wall and throws it through your apartment at Ash. And it, and it like knocks Ash sprawling into the living room. And there's debris and, and everything everywhere. So I think this is probably a good time to stop. This is a good like cliffhanger for us to pause on. But what do you think Curtis is going to do confronted with this troll charging into his, uh, his, not quite his, but almost his apartment? I think the next scene, if this game was to keep going, is looking for an escape route, <laughs> which would be 
uncomfortably elaborate and probably off of the balcony of the penthouse. Yeah, that's awesome. I love it. Good. Yeah, the wizard has a lot of power to like reshape the essence or nature of an exposed object or person, right? So you can even reshape yourself, like try to give yourself wings or do something that's going to give you an opportunity to get out of here. But you've done your best for Ash. We'll find out if you would be able to really honor that debt or whether you need to start to refuse to honor it because Ash is going to insist you you protect him. He seems pretty sketch. <laughs> well, <laughs> he is sketch. I mean, that's kind of what Urban Shadows is about, right? Is we all owe each other. And when those debts come due, you find your PC caught in this position of between a rock and a hard place, between what you've promised and what is happening around you. Great. Well, that was a lot of fun. Thanks. So, Mark, I'm really curious. The Kickstarter is live when this episode comes out. What are a couple of things you're really excited for in this Kickstarter specifically? The first thing I'm excited for is we we have a real passion at Magpie Games for bringing Power by the Apocalypse to new audiences. The Root Kickstarter was all about introducing this group of people who love board games and love the Root universe to Power by the Apocalypse. We are super excited to see a whole bunch of new urban fantasy fans connect with Urban Shadows 2nd Edition. And a big part of that's because Miguel and Marissa make these things look great. It's going to reach a whole new group of people. And then the second thing I'm most excited about is showing y'all some of the new playbooks, which we're going to keep a little under wraps until the Kickstarter, including The Sworn, who is a member of power who's sworn an oath to an order to enforce that order's laws, and The Goblin, who is a wild character who has found a way to stay in this dimension by running a business. And so they're like a courier or a cleaner or a proprietor and they own a bar or they do errands for folks and they're constantly caught up in their, the business of staying in this dimension. And those are both really, really exciting playbooks. That I can't wait to share with y'all. They sound really exciting. That's awesome. Mark, if people want to follow you on social media or check out more of the games that Magpie has released, where can they find them? MagpieGames.com is our brand new website that, again, Marissa and Miguel have made look beautiful. Please go check it out. We're really proud of it. And if you want to follow me in particular, I'm mostly at Twitter, at Trumons, T-R-U-M-O-N-Z. But you can also check out our Discord, where we have a whole bunch of cool conversations around our games and Powered by the Apocalypse. Just a couple weekends ago, we did a Powered by the Apocalypse design festival, where we talked about how to design games and, and kind of try to encourage our community to, to learn uh, some of the basics of, of making Powered by the Apocalypse games work. So please join the Discord, come have a conversation with us. We love talking with people about this stuff, and we'd love to talk with you. Well, Mark, thank you so much for coming on, sharing Urban Shadows second edition with us there will be a link in the show notes to the kickstarter which is live now thank you both so much and thanks rach that was awesome your your wizard sounds great plus one forward is a production of the gauntlet community richard rogers and rach schalke you can find us at gauntlet-rpg.com or follow us on twitter at at plus one fwd if you would like to support our show visit our patreon site at patreon.com slash gauntlet The games mentioned on this show use the Apocalypse Engine, which is a creation of Vincent and McGay Baker. The music for Plus One Forward is from the Savage Aural Hotbed CD, Gomi Daiko. The songs used are Gomi Daiko, Metal Version, and Drowning Attitude. You can find more amazing tunes by Savage Aural Hotbed on their website, www.savagearlhotbed.com. Hi listeners, Jason from Gauntlet Publishing here. I want to tell you about a couple of new things we have for you this month. The first is Nephews in Peril, a major expansion for Brindlewood Bay, the game of cozy murder mysteries and supernatural horror. Nephews in Peril is a collection of six new mysteries for the game, each by a different fabulous author and some revised rules and gameplay advice. It can be found in the $6 plus Gauntlet Patreon feed until October 15th and then drive through RPG after that. The next thing I want to tell you about is Codex Home, the first issue in Volume 5 of the magazine. Codex Home features new material for Trophy Gold in Brindlewood Bay, plus the all-new game Back Again from the Broken Land, which is about fantasy heroes recounting stories as they return home from a calamitous war against a Dark Lord, all while evading the remnants of that Dark Lord's army. It's a fantastic Powered by the Apocalypse game, and we're delighted to share it with you later in October. Remember, your contributions to the Gauntlet Patreon help support everything we do in the community, including this very podcast. As always, thanks so much for your support.